Surprisingly, if you're 60, that may be a benefit in this job market. This is the Focus Group. They're all business, except when they're not. It's the Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Welcome to the Focus Group. John Nash here with my good friend and co-host, Mr. Tim Bennett. Find us every week on YouTube and Facebook Live on Saturdays. It's our audio. And on Tuesdays, check out TFG Unbuttoned, which is our 20-minute sister or complimentary podcast to the Focus Group. And, of course, everything is available at focusgroupradio.com. And a big thank you to Deep Discount for being a partner of ours here on a weekly basis. They help us bring the show to you. And thank you for joining us. So, Tim... Almost the Memorial Day holiday, we had a uh, a really screechingly hot weekend. <laughs> How'd you, you guys did fare? You, did you? Uh, well, you don't have air conditioning either, do you? No, not the house. We 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 do in the bedroom. I didn't I didn't feel like pulling it out because uh, Saturday night was actually okay and Sunday wasn't so bad. So it's a little early. You know, climate change is upon us, John. You're going to have to buckle down. You're going to have to get air conditioning up there. I think. Yeah, we we've talked about it, and Bob has brought it up, and um, you don't like you know, air conditioning, though. You're like Aretha Franklin. <laughs> it, we should tell that story, Tim. Uh, when Tim back was at the automaker back in the day, they were sponsoring VH1 Divas, and they had uh, Radio City Music Hall booked for Are- it was Aretha Franklin, right? And right. Um, I met him there along with our friend the Comrade, and uh, they had this great cocktail reception in the lobby. And if you've ever been to Radio City Music Hall, it's like a multi-tiered, you know, lobby that you know you could look out from the different floors down to the main entryway. It's really cool Art Deco. And everybody was like, "Why are the doors to the auditorium closed?" Well, then they opened the doors. It was like you were on a polar expedition because they had that room super chilled. And it was because the minute you opened the doors, that was it. They weren't turning on the AC again till the end of the show when she was off stage because Aretha refuses to perform in she won't air perform in air conditioning, yeah. So even in Chicago, it was. I remember one of the Brits saying, "It's 110 goddamn degrees and humidity," and she won't, still won't come out of her room. <laughs> but but in contrast with David Letterman, I've never gone to the David Letterman show when it was recorded in New York City. But they said just the opposite. His they they said it would be so cold in his people studio, had to wear sweaters and jackets, yeah, yeah which I would have more preferred. I, I'd rather be. I'd rather have to put something on than to be uncomfortable and sweaty. But I think mm-hmm. you I think you're I think you're more of the you like the heat more than I do. I do to a degree. Like I did go cycling both days upstate. Um and it was usually in the heat of the day because I and I cut the grass. And by the way, our riding lawnmower is not the tractor's not been repaired. That's on the thirty first. I will say the grass does look uh I think the lawn looks a little bit better when it's done with a push mower. I maybe that's me and you're you know, crazy. I didn't mind the exercise. People don't want to go on the weekends and do lawn work. You're the only person I know that wants. We were talking about this this weekend. I was talking with friends. No one wants to go away and do work on the weekend. You love it. <laughs> the hell do you well, want to go cut grass on the weekend? You know, it was an hour and a half out of my life, maybe a little longer, and I, I got to walk and be. But by the end of it, it was like, I think, one uh, thirty when I finished the, the, the yard proper. And I just, and then Bob said to me, oh, could you go out and cut around the, the tomato bed? Cause it's, and I said, no, 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 you do it. I just did like an acre with the push tractor. Is Bob planting <laughs> tomatoes this year? Just tomatoes, yeah. Uh, uh, he may try strawberry plants again, although the last time we did strawberries, those chipmunks, that were like, wow, we get strawberries. A couple of days later, they were all gone because the chipmunks had come and eaten them. You don't have deer that come eat, do you? It's fenced in. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they can't get in. The chipmunks get in, though, huh? <laughs> that always reminds me of our friend John Regini and the one-armed squirrel. The one-armed squirrel, yeah. John and his wife, Nicole. Nicole had planted all these bulbs outside, and he's standing at the kitchen looking out the window, and he's seeing a squirrel dig up the, the bulbs, and she's, like, screaming, don't, you know, get that squirrel. And he realized the squirrel had one arm, and he thought, well, God bless the squirrel. If he can get that one nut up with the one arm, he deserves it. He found it, right? <laughs> he found a way. What can you yeah. do? It's like I was down visiting our friend Matt, and I saw a mouse in the kitchen run across the room. And I screamed like a little girl, and I said, you need to get get in your mousetrap. Kill that mouse. 
Oh, I, I want to have a non, uh, what did he call it? Non-kill zone? A, a non-kill trap for the mouse. I'm like, what are you going to do with a mouse? You're in the city. It's going to be a rat. <laughs> I said, you, you got to kill the mouse. Oh, I don't want to kill it. I, I said, well, you got to get it out of the house. The dog just looked at it, run by. <laughs> so I don't know what he's going to do. I don't want to go down there with a mouse hanging around the house. We have mice in our house upstate. We don't see them because they're like in the walls and everything. We know they're there. Do you have and mouse we traps? have traps. And sometimes we find, you know, a dehydrated one. Because the poison that you give a, a mouse, unfortunately, one. makes them very thirsty. They can't drink, though, because the, the poison does something. And they basically die of thirst. Are you doing poison? Water. Excuse me? Do you do poison? They're these little bait traps. They're they're yeah. enclosed like a little plastic box, and it, I guess the mice, you know, mm, food. <laughs> I had these white things. They went and you put peanut butter or something in them, and mm-hmm. they go in, and then it snaps their neck, and you throw it away. Now some people open them and save them over and over again. I won't open it and save them, but I usually just uh, I, when I lived in PA, I had mice that would come in all the time in the fall when it was warm. We knock on wood don't have any mice here down in down in Delaware, but uh, you got that rats I've seen, though. You got rats down there. There's a lot of rats. A lot of rats with two legs. (laughs) You read my mind. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, no, I, I, so, uh, well, okay. Chipmunks. I, for some reason, a chipmunk doesn't bother me, but a mouse does. But I don't want a chipmunk in the house either. No, no. I told you about the time we had a squirrel in the basement. No. I went down to, I went down to get the laundry out of the How'd it get in there? Uh, we think, we know, we know the squirrel. We had the, the top of the the flue open on the fireplace, which is this like lid that comes up <laughs> at the top of the chimney. And we had heard a noise the night before, like a tumbling noise, but we couldn't figure out what it was. Mouse got in that, or the squirrel got in that way. So I go down to get the dryer, and I open the dryer, and I'm st- putting the laundry in the basket. And I look to my right, and I'm just looking at a squirrel just sitting there looking at me. And I run oh, upstairs. He's and probably scared. Squirrel. So Bob puts a two-by-four from the floor up to this window and he opens the window and he just stands there. He goes, go on squirrel, go on. <laughs> and I'm like, what, you know? And so then he, then the squirrel goes up the, the ramp at the top. He looks back and Bob goes, goodbye, squirrel. Goodbye. Tell your friends. <laughs> the squirrel dashes out. I'm like, what's he going to tell his friends that they could joyride down the chimney and get a free lift out of the house. I don't know. God, the poor thing was scared. Probably. Yeah. They're clever though. He, 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 yeah. I, I have to admit, you know, for, for from the moments he put the board to the window, the squirrel figured out quickly, that's my way out. That's I mean, that's, 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 yeah. that's pretty smart. There's so a process. I'm not gonna, it's a process. Well, know. Matt, aside from the mouse, so Matt has the squirrel he calls Rocky that comes every day <laughs> and knocks on the door, and Matt gives him peanuts out of his hand. Really? And Yeah, Matt's turned into, you know, like Dr. Whatever, Doolittle. Dr. Doolittle. I was like, you know, between this mouse and now the squirrel, I was like, I, I got to, I said, they're going to be coming in the house. <laughs> classic right just yeah. classic no, i don't want any wildlife in the house no you don't and you know we had a bat in the house one time i came back from a bike ride i uh took a shower it was like five in the afternoon and i look into the bedroom and there's a bat flapping around on the carpet in the bedroom poor thing looked dazed and confused bob came up and gently wrapped it in a towel put it outside and Brought it to a dark spot near the 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 our back house, this like woodshed area, and then eventually the bat went and hung upside down because they were supposed to be sleeping in the dark. But that wasn't his normal spot, and then he disappeared. And uh, but you know they're not. I don't mind bats because you know bats eat about fifteen hundred insects a night when they're swooping yeah. around. Go to it, I say. Right? Yeah, bats are good, and so is a possum. To have Possums, in the yard really? Too. They oh, they eat. Uh, they'll eat hundreds of thousands of ticks. And uh, all kinds of uh, varmints in your yard. So if you have one in your yard, it's actually good to have. I'm going to tell Bob. Well, he'll he'll hear the show, and then he'll now ex- ex- he'll now accept that possums are okay. He thinks they're horribly ugly creatures. Well, they're ugly, but they eat they eat a lot of a lot of junk that you don't want around. So like that's ticks. I mean. Yes, well, ticks, and and I think they actually will eat mice too. I could mm-hmm. be wrong on that, but I do know that they they're good to have. All right, so this is good. This this may Bob may change his mind. Yeah. So on that note, what caught your eye, sir? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Well, I I don't know if this caught my eye more than it just. Uh, I guess it did. It caught my eye because I'm sharing it with you. But the the title is "Public Urination Damages Septa Elevator Repair Just Last Year." So Septa 
is the Southeast Pennsylvania Transit Authority. And they were putting in new elevators and putting in new flooring and trying to upgrade a lot of the infrastructure with the, um, with the subway line, which a lot of people don't know. Probably Philadelphia has a subway, certainly not as big as, as Manhattan or New York. It's five I've euros. taken it. I've taken it. But it's a, it's, a, it's a subway, one of the oldest in the country. And, but they're having a problem now. And I looked at it only because we had reported or I had reported many years ago about issues with urination uh, in public in San Francisco, particularly people were, were peeing on the light poles and it was uh, eroding the bases and these light poles were in danger of falling. And so when I saw this one, I thought, here we go again. But apparently what's happened is, as it said, um, urine has knocked out the elevators. So the transit uh, agency officials report that the new elevator flooring as well on the Market Frankfurt line has been has detached and warped because of the urine has loosened the epoxy. <laughs> that is kept disgusting. It in place. So they said, aside from the fact that it reeks, of course, um, the ur- that urine, human urine, is highly acidic and causes all kinds of damage, especially to the inner workings of elevators and sometimes escalators. So for the people that are handicapped or, or, or physically challenged, they have elevators that take you down into the subway like they do in Manhattan. Well, people are going on there to pee. And then it's getting into the, to the gears and to the motors and whatever and corroding them. And uh, as one of the officials says, we're losing ground here. We're always, tr- <laughs> we're always trying to fix, uh, fix up our rail system and make it comforting for people. We're always going 10 steps forward and then three steps back. So they just got another grant uh, last week for $6.1 million, and they're going to deploy dozens of security officers to patrol the subway lines and taking an aim. So they're going to uh, go after violators that are uh, harming the quality of life. And so they said many riders have complained of disorder, which includes smoking, which I can't imagine, but people are smoking on the train platforms, open use of IV drugs which I was shocked when I heard that public urination, feces, garbage, and fare jumping people just jumping over, not paying the elevator work they did last year cost $48,000 and the flooring was about 8,000. It was supposed to last for many years. It obviously didn't. They've had to close the station. They have to fix it. So of course the taxpayer or somebody along the line will be paying for that, but uh, not just a problem in Philadelphia, but uh, I, I imagine in a number of cities, we had done stories about, uh, I think it was London or a few places. I thought New York was going to try it with putting in mm-hmm. public restrooms. You're right. So people don't right. have don't have to with the, with the homeless problems we have as well within the country. We did, uh, and they and I think it was San Francisco that had tested outdoor freestanding like areas you could walk in to take a pee. Remember that right. it was like this like kind of curvy thing that you would walk behind <laughs> and then it would clean out so do, do they have them in new york now no we we have so few public bathrooms um that the ones that exist i wouldn't want to go into and then you know you have to go into a business or something to, right. to get your business done so to speak this um i i don't understand well you gotta you know, pee where are you gonna go you got a point, but why the elevator at the SEPTA station? And do you remember the time we uh, I came down for a dinner or a cocktail thing at um, Rittenhouse Square? I forget. It was part of a restaurant that was part of a hotel we were meeting at. And you're like, how'd you get here? I said, well, I took the train down, and then I took this little... The, I took SEPTA. Yeah, you took... A, I think they called the pig and whistle is what you took. Yeah, a little, and everybody... A little, little trolley, which I couldn't, I couldn't find that on a bet, and I lived in Philly for 30 years. I couldn't find the damn thing. I didn't know there was such a thing existed. And, and everybody at the gathering looked at me, and all the eyebrows go up, and they're like, wow, and you made it. <laughs> yeah. And then you insisted that I either walk back or take a cab back to the train station. <laughs> I think I drove you. Yeah, all right, would, so what yeah. caught my eye is something completely different. It involves our friends down in Texas. Uh-oh. And uh, the headline reads, and you're going to love the little pictures that accompany this, um, Creepy Dolls. Yes, creepy dolls covered in barnacles or missing their limbs keep washing up on Texas beaches. So the I'll read the article because it's actually very short. The stuff of nightmares is reality for researchers in Texas who survey the coasts for sea life and have recently found themselves staring down a creepy doll with barnacles for eyes. <laughs> Along a 40-mile stretch of beach on Texas's coastal bend from North Padre Island 
to Matagorda Island, researchers typically find 10 times the amount of trash they see on other Gulf of Mexico beaches. Jace Tanel, director of the Missions Arnas Reserve at the University of Texas Marine Institute, told the Star Telegram, which is their paper down there. Tanel said the disproportionate amount of trash is caused by a loop current that extends from the Yucatan Peninsula to Florida and pushes debris towards the Gulf, the Texas Gulf. That stretch of beach has become a valley of creepy dolls. So this guy, Tanel, sells the dolls at a yearly fundraising oh auction God. and has collected 30 dolls since he began to keep count of them. The Institute began to grow an online following after he posted a photo to the reserve's Facebook page of a sex doll <laughs> discovered on the beach. Could you imagine a sex doll just washed up on the beach? I guess it's a don't say gay moment, right? Um, someone later bought the sex doll's head for $35. and The proceeds were donated to a sea turtle rescue program. With the help of Mission Aranasis, Aran, Aransas sorry, and Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, valuable data collected will be used to assess restoration efforts in the Gulf in the coming years. So basically, they've been looking at this, I think they call it a gyre, G-Y-R-E, of trash that circulates around the Gulf depositing these dolls. But the one thing that the article didn't go into, which I was like a little bit disappointed about, is where do they think these dolls are coming from? And then I did another, I did a search and I found another article about the creepy dolls on the beach. And one scientist said, this is just typical trash. This is stuff that gets dumped in the ocean. Child's dolls. If you're watching on YouTube, I put up a picture, four pictures. My favorite is the, I guess it's like an Ariel Disney little mermaid doll. She's lying on her side. <laughs> the like, to me, that looked like Kate from the B-52s. The, the, yeah. That doll on the right. <laughs> The one laying on the side? Right. Are these dolls so that on the pictures, as John mentions, I, I love how people are holding them and smiling. Like, look what yeah. I got. But they seem awful big, or is that just the angle of the camera? You, you, you're so smart. So I thought about it myself, and I saw other pictures of similar people holding up the dolls, and it turns out that the way this was photographed, I think the photographer was using a wide-angle lens, and the closer you get into your subject the bigger the foreground looks and the smaller the background looks. That's so funny. in these pictures, some of these doll parts look enormous, and then the person holding it's like smaller, but it's just the uh, an optical thing caused by the lens. Yeah, I, 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 at first I thought, as as you were announced, that somebody was, was going to be found to have done this and, and throw them in the water there. But I guess if it was what, what a lot of municipalities still dump trash in the ocean, I guess, I don't know. And, uh, or it could be coming from a completely different source. But it is coming from trash that's been dumped in the ocean somehow. Could they be coming from Mexico? <laughs> no, I mean because you said it was a loop, right? And so yeah, off the coast, yeah. there, I'm wondering if you know there was something where they were, you know, if there was a flood or a storm, and then these, you know, the landfill. Because there might be other stuff there other than dolls. I wonder, huh? They this only mentioned the dolls, but that's you better funny. believe other crap gets washed up on the beach. I. Would These you buy one? Of... I can't imagine buying one. What would you do with it? I don't know. You'd display it, I suppose. I think the the perch, the the point of buying it or auctioning it off is to just help the organization that's trying to clean this stuff up or understand the ocean currents better. But it would be a weird talking point, right? Like someone, you, let's say your friends, like let's say Mark and Carl bought the Little Mermaid, the Kate, the the, the doll we think looks like Kate Pierce from the B fifty twos, right? Like you, so you go to their house and you're having cocktails, and you're like, and like what's this? Oh. Well, it's a doll that washed up on the beach in Texas. I mean, yeah. it's got a story, right? We paid four hundred fifty dollars for it, and the money went to the <laughs> turtle rescue. I, I think next time we go down down south, John, we, maybe we go to Key West or something. We'll throw some dolls in the water. Mm. You know what we should really throw in the water? It would be like some of those, like, Tom of Finland and the... Wasn't there, a, like, a an action figure that was supposed to be, like, a buddy? What was Billy. it, buddy? Wasn't it Billy? Billy. Yeah. And watch those wash up on, you know, on the shores. <laughs> well, that I, have a friend of, I have a friend of mine in Manhattan who collects doll heads. You told me about this Yeah, and she goes to she goes to thrift thrift stores or you know flea markets or whatever and buys them and another friend also that has a creepy doll collection she's in lancaster county pa and she posts them every now and then on facebook i went to college with both of them and some of the dolls are really they are creepy faces some of them i don't i don't want them in the house <laughs> hey did you watch that movie by the way or at least part of it that i sent you over the weekend uh-huh what did you yes. think yes so tell our Have listeners. Have you ever seen that, it before? No, this is news to me. How cheesy 
perfect is this someone said the most underrated film in history <laughs> period end of report yeah so tell tell people what this is called was it nude on the moon nude on the moon and nude it, on the moon, it, yeah. these two people are it's from the 60s right and they're they decide they're just gonna take a quick trip four days up and back they'll head to the moon <laughs> and how cheesy were the it was like they were wearing a fish tank and some goggles For their helmets right and they flew up to the moon and they land in the moon remarkably looks like louisiana or something <laughs> Palm trees, swampy, but then they find a nudist colony and they visit with the nudists, which is hilarious. And then they come back, and that's it. That's, that's it. Like a long weekend. <laughs> it's a long weekend to the nudist colony of the moon. On the moon, that yeah, movie that looks... got made. Nobody picked up our cartoon, but that movie got made. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim, I think that movie got made for far less than we spent on a test piece for animation. <laughs> that's for sure. Well, this was before implants, too. So it's the nudity is these women are all topless. Essentially is all it was, right? Yeah. Because I, I was poking through. And then they had some men in sort of Speedo-ish sort of... Uh, Thongy things. Yeah. yeah. But, but it was really the women bouncing around and mm -hmm. having fun frolicking on the moon. <laughs> you couldn't have watched the whole thing. I guess you found it in between, like, you know, meetings at, at City Hall or something. Tap, tap, tap. No, you tap. know what? Somebody had sent it to Facebook. And, uh, oh, you know, perfect. Tom Yaz from uh, Music Town Guy. does the videographer. Yeah. And Fred Schneider apparently said, oh, there was, there was. So Fred Schneider from the B 52s, again, in the doll, made some comment that I guess there was some sort of reality to all their movies because they had what, Nude on the Beach or Nude on the Moon yeah. was, was their one of their albums. And, um, so then they said, oh, I have a movie here. So, <laughs> yeah. So that was that. So, hey, thanks. We're, we're going to uh, we're gonna take a quick break. If you want to get movies, you can probably get a deep discount, right? Mm -hmm. You can probably head over there. Which, if you go to our website, uh, which is Focus Group Radio, you'll see our sponsors there. So click on them and, and uh, start shopping away. We appreciate it. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we have uh, a shop talk, which talks about entrepreneurial entrepreneurs and age and uh, we also have a business birthday which is also philly related i don't know how i got all this philly stuff this week so stay with us you're listening to the focus group with tim and john learn more at focusgroupradio.com Now, back to the focus group with Tim and John. Available pretty much everywhere. Welcome back to the focus group. John Nash with Tim Bennett. Find us at focusgroupradio.com, and that includes information about our partners, sponsors, and TFG Unbuttoned, our Tuesday podcast. This is the focus group, though, and this comes to you on video and audio. So enjoy. And at focusgroupradio.com, you'll find all our media. When's the audio the get released, John? Because I made a mistake on Unbuttoned. Saturday. We drop audio on Saturday because that is the traditional focus group day when we used to be on... Uh, satellite radio sirius xm satellite radio out q we were 11 to 1 live and uh we miss all you folks but we know you're still listening <laughs> right and we appreciate it very much so very much so so are you ready for um this i i did laugh when i saw the pictures come in and and i i i i'm expecting a history lesson which i hope you will give us so without further ado the business birthday Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So there were a number of captains of industry that had birthdays today. <laughs> this is May 25th. But um, and then there was a there were a few other ones, but I just couldn't um, get excited about them. And they were people that, you know, somebody that worked at Morgan Stanley or whatever. But this one, I thought, really, if you're a Philadelphian or somebody that knows Philly or has visited Philly, one of the Philadelphia is known for its soft pretzels and cheesesteaks, right? People love a Philadelphia cheesesteak and very difficult to replicate. Similar to a lot of New Yorkers who would say, um, I want a bagel, but the best bagel you're going to get is in Manhattan, right? Mm -hmm. And whether Agreed. it's the yeah. water 
or for whatever reason, it's like getting good pizza in New Haven, Connecticut, right? So Philadelphia is known for its cheesesteak. Many people have tried to copy it, and um, they just can't seem to get it right. So even my family will say to me, can you bring up a cheesesteak? Well, it doesn't travel well. <laughs> You know, so but no. but so the birthday today is actually one of the co-founders of the cheesesteak. He and his brother. So born today, May 25th in 1916 was Harry Oliveri and his brother, Pat Oliveri, were the co-creators of the cheesesteak, which uh, people know in Philadelphia. And they opened their their uh, shop, Pat's King of Steaks, in 1940. So pretty much anywhere, though, I always say, I always say to people, there's people have different tastes about where they where can I get the best cheesesteak? And there's always an argument. There's an area down around 9th, 9th and Wharton in Philadelphia, 9th Street, where there's a number of cheesesteak places, particularly Pat's and Geno's. But you can go into a little deli somewhere that does a cheesesteak and it'll be equally as good. Even in some of the suburbs, I've had some great, great cheesesteaks. So when anybody ever asks me, I'm just like, find a place that actually makes them and sells a lot of them and it'll be be pretty darn good lots of people trip up over them lots of politicians john Kerry, for instance came in and wanted mustard I, no obama wanted mustard Kerry wanted provolone no very very simple sandwich so um what are the ingredients well i'm gonna tell you so okay. olivari they was they were born he was born in south philly they moved back to italy the family moved back to italy and moved back and uh, the two brothers worked um in jobs pat made sleds during the day and harry worked at a navy yard at the Navy Yard in Philly. So in order to make um, additional money, they opened up a hot dog stand at 9th Street, and they sold mostly to cab drivers. So it was a way for them to enhance their living. So they both had two jobs, and they worked you know, 15, 18 hours a day, and they would sell hot dogs. And so every day they'd be, they would eat hot dogs as well, and they would get tired because they would go home and then for dinner, they'd have hot dogs. So they got tired of eating all these hot dogs. So one day, um, they're right near the Italian market. Uh, Harry went down and bought seven cents worth of steak from a butcher. And they put it on a grill and bought an Italian loaf of bread and grilled it up. One of the cab drivers pulled up and said, what are you doing? He's coming up to get his hot dog. They said, we're, e we're eating our dinner. We're tired of eating hot dogs. The cab driver said, I'm tired of eating hot dogs too. Sell me one of those sandwiches. <laughs> so they sold him a sandwich for 10 cents so this is in 1940 and then they started catching on everybody loved him so um that was in 1933 so 1940 they were able to rent a space and uh, they opened up uh what was the first steak so it was a philadelphia steak sandwich it wasn't a cheese steak cheese hadn't been been introduced yet so it was known as a steak wit, W-I-T. And to this day, that's how People you know still. whether somebody is from yeah. Philly or not. Because if you go up into Philadelphia and say, I'd like a steak with W-I-T-H, they know that you're from out of town. If you go up and say, I want a steak wit, you know that you're from <laughs> downtown. And wit simply means with onions. So you want a steak wit. So that was onions. Wait, 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 wait. That whole thing's been abbreviated. Steak with onions is abbreviated to steak wit. Steak wit. So you go to the window, okay. steak wit. How many? Two. Two steak wet. Boom. And you get them in, you know, 20 seconds. I mean, it really is. I just had one. My Our friend Susan Jay came in, and she lives in Seattle. And she used to live in Philly. Now she's like, you know what? I want a cheesesteak. So we went down. Literally, you, you pull up, you park. With, in 30 seconds, you've got your steak wet. So, uh, I mean, they're that quick. So no cheese was introduced, and so people had asked, and the reason was Harry said he wouldn't put cheese on any of the steaks because a lot of the people that came uh, and that were cab drivers at the time were kosher, and so they didn't want to put meat and cheese together. But uh, during the 60s, Harry went on vacation, and his son went and got a big container or a big bucket of cheese whiz and put it on the grill and heated it up, and then he ladled, ladled it over the steak and that's how the cheese came about. So when you do get an authentic cheesesteak, it's not provolone, it's not American cheese, it's cheese whiz that's melted and ladled on the top. Cheese whiz? Cheese whiz. So cheese whiz. So whiz. Cheese whiz. When you go up to the counter and you, if you don't say steak wit, but you just say steak, they, cheese is implied? So if you say I want a steak, you're going to just get steak. Okay. On a, bu on a bun. And then outside, they've got some ketchup and some relishes and hot sauce or something outside, maybe peppers. They, they have How do you outside get the cheese? Condiments. What do you ask for? So if you want a cheese steak, you'll say a cheese wit. 
which would be a cheesesteak with onions. Or you could just say cheesesteak, which means no okay. onions. So you either get a steak wit, which is just a steak, or a steak with no onion, or a cheesesteak, which is cheese and steak, no onion, or a cheese wit, which would be a cheesesteak with onion. If you come, I'll tell you what to do. Well, you, if I, I came down, I, yeah. I would do it. I would just get a uh, steak. So steak, that's it? Yeah. That, well, I would do you a You got to get a steak wit, John. You got to get a steak. No, you got to. You, you have to get the whiz. You got to get a cheese. So cheese it's steak. a cheese steak. You, you would you actually want a just say. Steak. You want a cheese steak. Cheese. But I don't want the onions, but I would do the cheese steak. Yeah. Why don't you want the onions? Eh, that can make me gassy sometimes. Oh, okay. Well, you don't like them then. They're cooked. <laughs> They're cooked onions. Does that Does that matter? Yeah, well, actually, cooked is probably better. Okay. So he ate cheesesteaks every day, Olivari did, pretty much. He, he, he had a heart attack, and then he, 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 he would still visit the store um, every few hours and visit people. And if you've ever been down there, I don't know if I've taken you there to where Pat's and Gino's is, which is really the epicenter where these cheesesteaks were invented. But it's open 24-7. They're only closed, I think, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And, uh, and they're open 24 hours a day. People will go 3 in the morning after the bar, so they'll go in for after a shift at, at, you know, if you worked all night, you'd go in at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., and that would be your dinner. But uh, poor old Harry died of a heart attack on uh, July 22nd in 2006 in New Jersey at 90. Well, and, uh, his sons you know, currently run the business. For living on... Uh, or his grandson runs the business, I'm sorry. Yeah, for living on steak wit or cheese, cheese steak, cheese steak wit. Wait, it goes steak. Cheese wit. You want a cheese steak? Wit. You want a steak? A steak or a steak cheese wit. wit. No, a steak wit. That's yes. Steak All right. Onions. So wait, wait, wait. Steak, steak wit, and cheese. A, or a cheese steak. Or a or cheese, cheese wit. steak or a cheese wit. Cheese wit. I get cheese okay. wit. I want the I want the onion and I want the and I want the I want you the want cheese. You want the so he dies at ninety. Mm-hmm. So it can't be such a bad diet, cheese steaks, right? If he made it to ninety. Well, you know, you you think not. I mean, it was actually real steak. You know, when they initially made them, they was it was real steak meat. So they just grilled up steak and put it on a sandwich. I mean, how tough was this? I don't know why we can't invent things. I get aggravated when I see these things. The guy's a bazillionaire. Well, he's dead too. And use cheap <laughs> whiz. I mean, you can't use cheaper. You know, seven cents of scrap meat he buys off the butcher, throws yeah. it on an Italian roll, sells it to the cabbie. Next thing you know, he's got you know he's got a beautiful home in Stone Harbor. <laughs> and he's eating cheese uh, of course they work their asses off i mean these people yeah. worked hard so he's eating cheese wit every day with his wife on the deck uh, cheese wit you know, is there anything you cook that you think you could you could like is there something like a cookie or something that you make that you think you could sell and make some coin on nope 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 i'll was, get to it i'll get to work on it i, I, no, I, I was see trying this to think a... that too you know, we had because we had Kate making us the ice cream, right? We had the lemon and orange, and the key lime ice cream was, I think, the winner. Fantastic, one of our best. Right, and yeah. so I, so I, but I'm trying to think. You know, you we got to hit on something, John. Something tangible, though. I can't I sell still software. Think, I still think the uh, yeah, you real world. Like I still think that orange and the key lime ice cream. We, you, and I just don't want to be wearing the smocks, pushing a cart around on the bro, the bar, the boardwalk at uh, Rehoboth, right? To me sweating it, yeah, you know, with that. the little paper hat on. <laughs> <laughs> Although you can come here for the summer and sell, you know, Bob can come in on the weekends, and then I'll come back to your place and dump any uh, the cash in a little cigar box. You'll close the <laughs> lid and say, "I'll get back to you with what the day's receipts were." John, yes, John. you made a what dollar. Did we, what did you do today, John? Well, I gave a couple away. <laughs> melted. You would check the inventory. You'd be like, "That's not lining up." Yeah. No, you'd be pretty good about it, though. I would trust you with that. Yeah. <laughs> you, then you would spot check. You'd come out to the boardwalk to see how I was selling them. You'd stand aside with a pen and paper, probably a pencil and a little pad, and you'd make notes. And you'd come over and say, "Okay, when you you, you gotta upsell this, you can't. You right. know, don't tell people to try it out first. It's the best they've ever had. You know, it would turn out like that, right? You know, it's funny. I, I I'll ask this question because I don't know if I have the answer to to this one with you. Is that so Philadelphia is known, late night, people leave the bars, the bars close, they'll go get a cheesesteak. And Detroit, they would go get a Coney dog, you know, the hot dog, the chili dogs. And Pittsburgh, you'd go to Primanti's and get the, the sandwich everybody loves there, I guess, or a, like a, a brat thing. I don't know what we used to do in Chicago. I don't think there was anything. Pizza? Deep dish? Yeah, you really can't. That's deep dish when it doesn't work well no. at, you know, at 2 in the morning. And what would you do in, 
in P Town, you go stare at us pizza and get a slice, right? <laughs> yeah, and in Manhattan, it's a diner. It, it's, oh. Let's get some eggs. Let's get something in a diner. And and back back in the day, and it's still here. The Odeon was our favorite downtown spot for, which is like a French bistro right. for like late night, which would be like potatoes and eggs and stuff like that. Yes, yeah, so, so you diner. would go to a diner. That's interesting. That's that's kind of fun though. I think I used to like yeah. that. I would go with a friend, and he would. There was a diner here in Philly called the Savoy. And you know we'd be in there at two thirty in the morning. He would get the fried fish platter. Yeah, can you imagine at two thirty a.m. And I say, where do you think you are? You know these are these are Mrs. Paul's fish sticks, and they're scraping a scallop off us. It was a collection of five fishes. You never really knew what it was other than the shape. <laughs> and uh, but he swore by it, and he'd get a he'd get a chocolate milkshake at the Savoy. At the Savoy. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's a good way to slide into our shop talk, I suppose. <laughs> well, I'm looking, looking for to, money. The the bridge too far I'm trying to create here. So the headline of this shop talk I found, which I, I, I personally like, is the secret of my success as an entrepreneur, I'm 60. And uh, this kind of goes against the grain for what you know a lot of us have experienced um, in the job market, which is the older you get, the less important you are to hiring managers. But in this case, this uh, gentleman said, experience, judgment, and battle-tested expertise are underrated assets in specifically the startup world. And the more you've got, the better. So to paraphrase the article or to kind of collapse it down to its um, basics, his thesis is that you know an older worker is going to bring to the table an incredible amount of experience that younger workers just don't have only because they haven't been around as long as us or many of us. And he broke it into uh, three different categories or silos of what those things are, three or four that we actually do bring to the table. So why don't we kick that off, Mr. Bennett? So, well, so I, before we kick it off, though, did you agree with this? I'm not exactly sure that I agreed with everything. I, you know what? I, you know, I'll, I'll answer that better. I want to agree with it. I like the thinking behind it, but I don't know that this actually happens in the real world. Is that a better answer? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the overall concept is is the importance of having what was the first thing experience or or, or uh, intuition, right? So. The fact that you've been there and done that, you've seen it all, so you have a way of dealing with something. For instance, when you and I deal with clients now, different than we may have if we were 25 or 30, you have, because you've seen it or you've solved the, what did you always say, you, you, we've, you've already solved the puzzle before. A couple times. Yeah, the wheels spun around a bit. Right, and you've seen it before, and we've all seen certain behaviors, and uh, so you know how to deal with it. So that becomes a very, that becomes a very important thing. So I did agree with that one. That was that was the experience aspect of it, right? Well, the next one, well, so experience is one of those first silos. Um, the next one is called disruption. By the law of averages, if you reach four decades of work experience, then you know what it was like to be disrupted both personally and as a business. And this is never a pleasant experience. So maybe it's a revenge thing, but people my age, his age, 60, uh, who choose to become a disruptor should expect a plate of delicious, unadulterated satisfaction. Going from the hunted to the hunter is as good as it gets. Um, I also agree with this disruption. I would just actually call this, it's almost like uh, expect the unexpected, right? And and the more that you move through your career and the more that you have to put out fires and deal with the unexpected, um, the more you're going to roll with the punches and the better off you'll be as a problem solver, I think. Uh, I remember once showing up at my first agency and my business partner at the time said, how much change do you have at home? And I said, I don't know. He goes, well, go home and get it. <laughs> so I bring back like two jars to the office. We rolled pennies, nickels, and dimes all day, went to the bank. And when he cashed it, he said, that's what you got to spend for the next couple of weeks. Um, that's a disruption in my opinion, <laughs> an unexpected disruption, right? Yeah, well, I was going to ask you what an example that would be. And that, that's a good one because I was trying to figure out the, the disruption piece of it because the very end when he said going from hunted to hunter is as good as it gets, I guess it's um, just knowing how to deal with it, right? Yeah, yeah. As well. The other, uh, the other uh, item was stature. So it said developing stature is only possible with long periods of achievement. And, of course, it takes time. So they say founders without stature will always have trouble connecting with customers of stature. 
So I used to find this when I was a headhunter, when I would I would be a a young twenty something headhunter and trying to hire an experienced commercial lender, for instance, at a bank. And you know, these people you're speaking with had far more experience and knowledge mm-hmm. of what the job was or the job would entail than I was trying to explain to them. But had I been older, had I been the age I am now trying to do it, I think um, certainly would you'd come with more credibility because you come with some stature and experience and or success. And again, it's the same with you and I with agency work. Um, having had stature in terms of successes and campaigns, it, uh, you, don't, you don't have to do a lot of the explaining of why, you know, why Tim and John or why Triberry, right? Correct. And it's that, I, I think that's summed up perfectly. Um, stature can be even so much more than we're discussing here, but I think it is, in fact, that, that lived experience. Um, and having, you know, I, I think for what Tim was hinting at as well with the agency side is, you know, I had lunch recently with uh, a gentleman who was giving me some feedback. Um, and he gave me an answer to a question I didn't want, or I wasn't expecting to hear, but then he said something fascinating. He goes, you know, you've, he goes, the last 20 minutes you've talked about meeting some of the biggest global chief marketing officers at some of the biggest brands in the world, or you've worked with some of the biggest brands in the world. He goes, and you say it quite casually. He goes, I have to tell you that there are many people who have not had that experience. And, and I think Tim would concur that, you know, how you comport yourself around whatever age you're at, um, how you comport yourself around senior management is really key. But it's gotten easier and easier for me to be around a CMO or a CEO, CEO or a chairman of a board because at the end of the day, as you get older and older, you realize they're just people doing their job. And if you approach, approach them like that, they, are, they really appreciate that a lot more than this kind of golden halo, right? Well, what is it that our, our friend Chris in California would say? How's your bullshit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how's your bullshit doing? And, and once you get to that playing field when, when we all acknowledge that some of the stuff we do is just ridiculous or idiotic, it just makes yeah. that connection so much easier. So one of his last silos here on this piece about you know your value at 60 is purpose. And I do find this one fascinating. Most young people become entrepreneurs because they want to become rich. For 60-somethings, this is not the goal. Instead, older founders become entrepreneurs because they want purpose. And we all know that the best purpose involves serving others. Take a moment and ponder that one. Serving others is what successful business is all about, and sometimes it takes a lifetime to figure that out. Um, I'm a big fan of this purpose notion here, but I'm not such a big fan of how he... I don't think that every 20-something wants to be rich. I think that sometimes they want to change the world. Right. And I, I think that the money part comes in after that. But what was your take on purpose? Well, I, I feel the same way you did. There are many young people that, uh, particularly Gen Z, that want to have work with purpose. Mm-hmm. So, But maybe this is an entrepreneur thing that I want to, I want to work for myself and make my own money and not answer, have to answer to anybody. At the end of the day, you, everyone always has to answer to somebody, whether it's yourself or it's, it's uh, your accountant or whoever. There, there's always somebody you have to answer to or you should answer mm-hmm. to. So, yeah. and, and then the end of the, this end of the piece though, then talks about successful people, of course, at Apple. Uh, they used Apple, Chick-fil-A, and Netflix as examples of people uh, that are running these companies that are in their 60s and in some cases maybe even a little older and about how uh, – Things like Netflix, things like Chick Fil A, uh, Apple are very much uh, ingrained in younger generations. So when a younger generation, generational person says, "Oh, these old guys, old geezers, old women can't run anything. They're they're not with the times," it's like, well, some of your favorite brands or favorite uh, products are actually run by people that are older. That, it, that was a touch disingenuous because let's think about it. Reed Hastings at Netflix, he's sixty-one years old today. He's been the chairman of Netflix for several years. He was in his 50s when that started. Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, He's been at took Apple over since he started, upon, right? Yeah, he he died he took over after Steve Jobs passed away and so he was in his mid 50s when that happened. So what he wasn't 60. I mean, he happens to be 60 now. So a little cherry picking on the data, right? Yeah. I think the over, overriding thing and of course when you're when you're having to write a uh, article for a magazine. <laughs> this came from Fast Company, right? And it was a Yeah. Harry McCracken, I think his name was. You know, you you um, you got to pump it out, and so you're gonna you're gonna make it fit 
fit your mold. But I think the, for me, the takeaway was that there's value with wisdom and there's value with experience. And per, and, yeah. And, yeah. and you need to take advantage of it and not all of a sudden think that, well, I'm 60 years old, nobody wants me. Exactly. Which, exactly. We all, which we all do as we're getting older. Everyone says you want to hire a younger person, they're cheaper to hire, and they're not going to have the, uh, the cost associated with somebody who's been around a while. However, um, I'm all for hiring people that are experienced. Oh, uh, look, look I, I would rather hire someone that had the experience and, and was older, but that's me, you know? Yeah, I remember one time when I worked at Walden Books, I don't know if you remember this, but they hired a woman um, to be a sales associate, and, and I, was, I was 17, and the rest of the people were probably in their early 20s. And this one was 78 years old, and she had run the Roxbury, Connecticut general store. In fact, she had filled up the gas for Arthur Miller when he went down to go sell his play, The Death of a Salesman. She, she you need to describe gas. the Roxbury General Store. It looks like something out of Andy Griffith, by the way. Yeah, well, Roxbury in general. So, yeah. um, <laughs> But we couldn't believe that the manager had hired her. She says she's going to run circles around all of you, which she did. The woman's name was M. She went up and down, up and down the ladders. And the greatest thing, I remember the power went out, and we had to work, the, and the registers didn't work then. Because, you know, everybody was relying on, I, you mm -hmm. gave me 305, so what's your change? She was in there with her fingers to doing it all in her head because she that's how she, she operated. And she actually was a godsend and a huge, huge, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not a benefit, but she was a, 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 a very welcome employee to have because of all of her experience in dealing with the public and customer service and working with things that just... Something goes wrong, she knew right away how to fix it. How to Which fix it, yeah. A 16, 17, 20-something didn't necessarily know what to do. C couldn't make change without the computer, right? Oh, my God. that's But well, that's the biggest one right there. When you said yeah. the power goes out, she was actually ringing people up, giving in her them head, the and proper doing the change. Tax, yeah. Doing the tax in her head. And, you know, so you'd bring up three books, and she'd be like, D -d 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 in her head, and boom. No, no, we'd, I'd still be there trying to figure it out. <laughs> Right. She down. was a boon to the business. Yeah, she was a huge hire, huge benefit to the business. Exactly. So well, that's a good article, Mr. Nash. I'll, I'll hire you, even though you're not 60. <laughs> Just about. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate you, uh, you spending time with us. As always, be sure to head over to focusgroupradio.com. You'll find all of our media there, including our podcast, which is TFG Unbuttoned. All of our media is there for you to download or to uh, to watch and or listen or take with you as the summer is coming. Take us to the beach and catch up on all our past episodes. You'll also see our sponsors there in the margin. Click on them and start shopping away. We appreciate that as well. So remember to uh, be careful out there on the roads. A lot of people are driving, particularly this holiday weekend. So uh, don't text and drive. Arrive alive. And we'll see you on Tuesday on TFG Unbuttoned. Take care. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.